Today's scripture reading is taken from 2 Timothy 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Demasia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I send Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the matter worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him, because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Arrested stayed in Corinth and then left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, FBC. I think you'll be surprised to see me preaching to you this morning instead of Alex. Well, the problem is we have EMCO. And because of the EMCO, people are not allowed to come to church to record sermons, etc. So this is one day before the EMCO. So therefore, I'm rushing in an emergency sermon uh, to to ensure that we actually have uh, enough time to do this. Alex will present the sermon much later on and I will basically carry on during this EMCO period of time. So I hope you forgive me for some shortcomings of this particular sermon. Uh, What I've done is I've taken a chapter out of uh, our Gamma series on 2 Timothy, this time it's chapter 4, and we're going to use that as a sermon instead. So um, let's get together and pray and ask the Lord to guide us this morning. Uh, Father Lord, we are entering difficult times um, with this COVID-19 crisis for which the pain and the death and the mortality seems to be endless. And now we're all locked down at home even much more stringently than before. So we're going to ask, O oh Lord, that this morning that you just fill us with your Holy Spirit as we listen to your word, that your word will minister to our hearts during this time of discouragement. We ask for your strength and your guidance for Jesus' sake. Amen. The title of our sermon today is basically Finishing Well. And it's basically the last letter which Paul writes to his disciple Timothy. Here is Paul. What does he say in these last days 
before he actually dies. You know, I had a friend of mine whom I've known for about 20 years who has done many things, very successful in the media, radio talk show, TV talk show. And he was sharing with me recently of a relationship that he had been in for the last 10 years on which it sort of fell apart. And he was wondering what life is all about. And I think it's after some time of introspection that we actually realized that so many things that actually happen in life to us. And when you look back and stand back, what is important is hard to work out unless we actually have our direction of life well anchored in something that will actually last. He'd done a lot of things, but at the end of time, at the end, towards the latter or autumn part of his life, they don't seem to have mattered very much. So he's just confused. Now I wanted you to look at Paul's life. Here's a man at the end of his life, well, he's not successful, you know, if you look, he's not a TV presenter, he's not a radio presenter, he's not a celebrity, he's alone, he's imprisoned, he's abandoned. You're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me among them who are Phygelus and Hermogenes, uh, 2 Timothy 1.15, and he's facing a Roman trial and instead of having his lawyer stand with him or his relatives stand with him, he's abandoned. And he's waiting for his execution. I am, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. This is it. This is the end. What has he got to show for it? Not a huge bank account, not a couple of houses, no dato title, just the bare floor of a prison. But he finishes well. And basically this chapter gives us three things for us to think about during these difficult times. The need to leave behind in our lives a spiritual legacy. The need to warn others of the spiritual challenges of the time. And the need to pour out our lives for the things that really matter. Leaving a spiritual legacy. Here we have Paul and he charges his young charge, Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, able to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So this is the last time he's got to be able to write to Timothy. He's asking him very solemnly, because he's charging, not just telling him to preach the gospel, he's telling you, charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is also, by the way, the judge of the living and dead, which means he's talking about accountability. All right? I'm going to charge you, and this is something you've got to be accountable to God for, because he's the, Christ is the judge, the living and the dead, by his appearing, which means this is a hope to which we are, uh, Timothy and Paul, are looking forward to, and his kingdom. So this, what does he charge him to do? To preach the word, ready in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort. And here's Timothy, young man, a young pastor, Church of Ephesus, perhaps inexperienced and shy, perhaps a physical infirmity, having trouble with his stomach, maybe a gastric ulcer, bullied by the church there because they are false teachers as well. They're all looking down at his age. And, 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 and Paul challenges him. And why he can challenge him is because he has walked with Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, not only that, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, and yet from all of them, the Lord has rescued me. It's not the words that we actually teach people that will make an impact. It is not only teaching, it is also how you live your life, how you actually exemplify it and lift up the gospel, and that would inevitably involve persecution and suffering, and how through all that, God had actually rescued him. So there are four imperatives, so he tells him, you have to preach the word, in season, out season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. And the words here are reprove, we show the fault of error, convince someone of his error. Rebuke is basically command, to scold, to show fault, to express strong disapproval. But it's a bit strange, isn't it? Uh, because in 
most of our modern churches, our attitude is we see no evil, we hear no evil, we speak no evil, we, everybody do their own thing. Otherwise, there'll be trouble in the church. On the other hand, there are also church members who are judgmental, always picking on the faults of other people who are, have weaknesses in areas of which they have, themselves have strengths. Now, Paul recognizes that we are all in one body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you actually have someone who's got sexual immorality of a kind that's not even tolerated among pagans, which means the sexual immorality he's got that has happened among the midst is so bad that even non-Christians don't even see it. A man and his father's wife. Are you arrogant? Are you not to warn, mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So they've got to take action. They've got to recognize the fault, reprove, rebuke, and encourage. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may have, that you may be a new lump. Leaven is yeast, and yeast represents sin. So therefore, if you are really a body of Christ, you don't have sin. It's a body like flour without the yeast. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, sin, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the leaven of bread of sincerity and truth. So therefore, the body of Christ is like that bread. And you can't have sin within that bread breaking it apart. We've got to reflect the spiritual reality of who we actually are. So therefore, reproof, rebuke is so important. To And not only that, reproof, rebuke, but we also come alongside each other to encourage. It's not truth that is all important and we exclude love. We have to tell the truth in love. So parakaleo is exhort, is to come alongside and encourage and bring comfort. This parakaleo is the same word we use in Greek for the Holy Spirit who is sent along to comfort us, to give us strength and to teach us. So therefore, we're not only to reprove, rebuke, we're also to exhort each other, to bring each other in a walk that is holy before the Lord. So we have to reprove, rebuke, exhort, and the manner in which we're supposed to do it, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, must be kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his own opponents with gentleness. So the manner in which we do it is with kindness, patience, and with gentleness. Now, why do we need to do all these things? Well, because of the spiritual challenges of the church. We need to warn people of the challenges of the time. The challenge of the time is what we see in our world today. Same as what Ephesian church, what Timothy faced in the Ephesian church is what we face today. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to truth and wander off into myths. That is the times of which we live. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear something that will suit their own passions or desires. And, and this is what we struggle with, isn't it? 1 Peter 2, 11, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against our soul. And our struggle in this world, this side of the kingdom, is that we have a body that wants to indulge itself. And then we have our desire to please Christ. And so therefore, the, the problem is we perceive the quest for happiness is to indulge our physical desires. A.W. Tozer, there's a famous Christian pastor in Chicago many, many years ago writes these words when he sees the differences between the new kind of faith and evangelicalism that had been taken over his country versus what he was used to. And he says, I see a right, the cross of popular evangelicalism is not the cross of the New Testament. It is rather new, bright ornament upon the bosom of a self-assured and carnal Christianity. The old cross slew men. The new cross entertains them. The old cross condemns. The new cross amuses. The old cross destroyed confidence in the flesh, but the new cross encourages us. And then we can see this in how Christians in the West have pushed forward with the example now is the prosperity gospel, but it started off with people like Robert Schuller, 1982, who put forward the idea, the most important thing we need to tell the whole world is self-esteem. Psychology is important. We have to bring it into the Christian faith. And he said the, Christ, the secret of winning unchurched people into the church is really quite simple. Find out what will impress the non-church into your community and then give it to them. No longer about sin, rebellion. It's actually about self-esteem. Bill Hybels uh, from the Willow Creek Church put forward this idea that the most important need is personal fulfillment. This is a moving on from self-esteem. The most important need is personal fulfillment, the pursuit of happiness. Sin now redefined, not rebellion against God, deserving of spiritual death, 
Sin is now redefined as a flawed strategy to gain fulfillment. And so therefore, we've got two kinds of gospel. A gospel which people's itching ears will want to hear because it follows the passion of the flesh, which is a gospel, it's all about us, how we can find fulfillment, right? About true happiness in life, how Christ will bring us happiness, how Christ will raise our self-esteem. You know why? Because God loves us and we sing all these songs about how God loves us and dies for us and that's all we're interested in. Or how freedom from emptiness and loneliness is why we come to church or why we listen to the gospel, why we open up to our five the, our favorite Bible uh, passages. But the true gospel is all about God, not us. It's all about how do we worship and glorify Him, not how we feel good about worshiping Him. It's about sin and about death. It's about our need for righteousness and our need to live holy lives to honor and glorify Him. It's a distinctly different gospel which the world wants to listen to. The purpose of worship is to ex clearly express the greatness of God not to find inward release and still less amusement. A lot of times, whether you're in an Orthodox church or whether you're a charismatic church, we want to feel the presence of God. Feeling, the revival of feeling is more important than the knowledge of God. The feeling is more important than conviction or informed commitment. This is uh, William James who many years ago wrote and did some research on religious experiences of Christians and other uh, religions. And they found a lot of people have a lot of feeling religious experiences in religion. And his conclusion was, so long as men can use their God, they care very little about who he is, or even whether he's, he is at all. God is not known, he is not understood, he is just used. Are we using God for an experience only? See, a lot of people come to the church or say they come to Christ, but the direction of their life is unchanged. Christ is just a optional, added extra, just like you're running a race with a racing car and Christ is a pit stop where you go and repair your tire, put more petrol and you're off again until you come to another bend and you go for another pit stop. Let me give you an example. Ahaz, king of Israel, northern kingdom, some years ago, 1 Kings chapter 22, talks about him wanting to um, invade the Syrians, Arameans at Ramon Gilead. And before he did that, he would ask his um, prophets. And the king of Israel gathered the prophets together and about 400 men and said to them, shall I go into battle against Ramon Gilead or shall I refrain? So he wants to go to battle. He wants to make sure he wins. So therefore he asked all the prophets and they say, hey, good, go up. The Lord will give it into the hands of the king. But Jehoshaphat, one of his advisors, said, no, is there another, not another prophet of the Lord whom we may inquire? See, the 400 prophets already have a consensus that he's going to win. But Jehoshaphat knows there's a real prophet around. And that real prophet is Micaiah. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, yeah, yeah there's, there's one man by whom we may inquire the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imla, but I hate him. He never prophesies good about concerning me, but evil. The reason why he hates this guy is because see, this guy tells the truth. He doesn't want to hear the truth. Ahaz doesn't want to hear the truth. Ahaz has itching ears and he's got his own passions. He wants to attack Ramon Gilead. He doesn't want to hear bad news. He knows Micaiah is around, but he doesn't want to ask him. Anyway, he's persuaded to ask for Micaiah's advice and the messenger goes to Micaiah. A messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophet are with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the one, the word of one of them and speak favorably. So you go to see the king, better say the right thing, you know, if you know what's good for you. So Micaiah is under pressure. He goes to the king. And when he comes to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramon Goliath to battle or shall we refrain? And here we have Micaiah. I think he's a bit shaken. He says, oh, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hands of the, of the king. He seems to have taken the line of all the 400 prophets, gone with the majority. Moment of weakness, perhaps. But the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Although he doesn't like this particular prophet, Ahaz realized that this guy is the real deal. He'll tell me stuff that I don't like to hear. And so therefore, I think you're, you're, you're just joking, you know? Uh, tell me the truth. And you know what Micaiah said? Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. The Lord has declared disaster on you. 
disaster. Wow. So it has, if he actually believes Bakaya, he would actually say, okay, I'm not going to fight the Ramon Gilead. It's disaster. I'll pull back. But Ahab was always disobedient to God anyway. So he thought he could escape. Thought he's smarter than most people. Instead of riding the king's chariot with all the gold and regalia and all the royal emblems, he actually disguised himself and slipped into the battle incognito. And you know what happened? a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. Right between the two, there's a joint. What are the odds? Stray arrow. And Ahaz was killed. Micaiah's prophecy was correct. Isaiah says, who says to the seers, do not see. And the, says to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions, leave the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. We live in a time just like Isaiah where we tell our teachers, our pastors, our prophets, our elders, don't tell us what is right, tell us what is nice. That is the, the, the time in which we live. No better example than the last election in America where we actually have Donald Trump. Did you know that when he was, uh, just before he was elected, there were 40 prophets, no less than 40 prophets and pastors and teachers and elders in the Church of America, the evangelical movement, they all prophesied that God said he would actually become president again. They failed. And Ruth Graham, wife of Billy Graham, wrote an article published in the New York Times on the 12th of February this year, Christian prophecy movement hit hard by Trump's defeat. It would seem that all these prophets were fake. All these churches were fake because they prophesied the wrong thing. One of the top prophets then is a young 33-year-old man by the name of Jeremiah Johnson. He actually prophesied correctly that Trump would be elected in 2016 when nobody else gave him a chance. He actually prophesied. Uh, prophesied correctly, so everybody listened to him. And he actually prophesied this, time, prophesied this time that Trump would be elected in 2020, and it failed. And he actually had the honesty to come out and apologize to the church. And he said these words, nine out of 10 messages I was preaching were about the Lord. Nothing political or current, but because that one, which is the one about Trump, would go viral and grab so much attention, I think it became toxic. And it became dangerous over time. He was swept along. And he said these words, and to be candid, he says, whether you want to call it a temptation or not, that's what sells. He was selling books. If you feed the people of God, not the truth, because they don't want to hear the truth. They're not like, they're like Ahaz, I don't like true prophets because they tell me bad stuff, All right? I want to hear something nice. And so therefore that's what sells. Go to any church that have got prophecy classes. You will find all they will prophesy about is who you will marry, what profession you will get, and they will never prophesy you'll get cancer at the age of 35. They will never do that because it's not what you want to hear. Our Lauren Stanford, I, another prophet who prophesied wrongly and apologized. He said, I allowed myself to be caught up in a prevailing stream and to be carried along by it. In doing so, in doing that, I actually compromised what the Lord had already told me years before. Another prophet apologized, Sean Bolts, for being wrong. He actually received death threats because he apologized for being wrong. And they actually threatened him, said, when Trump's re-elected again, don't know when, you will be strung up in front of the White House and killed as a false prophet. You see, the theology people have changed. They believe in the seven mountains of culture which Christians must capture in a Christian country, arts and, and, and entertainment, business, education, family, and government. And it's in line with the kind of thinking that Christians want to be supreme. The same kind of thinking that made the Crusades, you know, all these kings drive into the Middle East to reclaim Jerusalem. Now we live in an age where there's micro-targeting, when, when the, the people behind the screen in Facebook are looking at what you like and what you don't like, and they feed you the news that you like, not unlike false teachers. And not only that, they will use scripture. Two kings, one kings uh, 22, 11, Zedekiah, son of Chaniah, made for himself horns of iron and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they're destroyed which means go to Ramon Gilead. And all the prophets prophesied 
so and said, go up to Ramon Gilead and try if the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And so now for why is he saying the horns of iron? Well, because Zedekiah is using scripture. He's saying, we're going to fulfill scripture. There's a prophecy. You know why? Because in, in Deuteronomy 33, 17 says, a firstborn bull, bull got horns. He has majesty. And his horns are the horns of a wild ox. And with them he shall go the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. They are the tens of thousands of Ephraim and there are thousands of Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph and they represent the northern kingdom. And so what Zedekiah was saying, when he made himself a horde of horns, he said, with these horns you'll push the Syrians until they destroy. He says, we are using scripture. It is prophesied that this horn of horns, he will gore the people, all of them to the ends of the earth, these are basically the victorious northern kingdom. Nathan Yahu from uh, Israel also uses scripture, right? Uh, to, to, to prove his false prophecies. Here he says to President Trump, we remember the proclamation of the great King Cyrus, Persian king, 2,500 years ago, he proclaimed that he, Jewish exiles in Babylon can come back and rebuild our temples in Jerusalem. And we remember how a few weeks ago, President Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Mr. President, this will be remembered by our people throughout the ages. He's now inferring as if Trump is that Cyrus using scripture. See, people will use all sorts of things except the truth. For the time is coming when people not endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion and will turn away from listening to truth. And then when you turn away from listening to truth, you know what will happen? You will listen to myths and wander off into myths. And all the people who cannot accept that Trump was not actually elected, Johnny Enlow, one of the prophets, you know what he's saying? If you can see what's happening in heaven, he can see into heaven. Who is sitting up on the throne? Go up and look at the presidency seat in heaven and see who's sitting there. It ain't Biden, it's Trump. The guy is so deluded, he's gone to the midst as if in heaven you can see not Biden sitting there, it's actually Trump. Now, this is what the culture is like, all right? And the culture is to listen to falsehood and not truth. And if you can look at how Paul dealt with it, this is a picture of the, in Athens, of the Parthenon, a stone's throw away from it is this little hill called Mars Hill. On this hill were lots of idols and altars and temples. It's all torn down now, but Paul was there in Acts chapter 17. And, and here's a place uh, where it worshipped the multiplicity of gods, which characterized the culture of Greece at the time. They've got Zeus, Jupiter, you've got Aphrodite, every single kind of known god. They're all worshipping them. There are so many gods that they worship that they even had an altar that was dedicated to the unknown god. All right, to cover their bets. It is against this background of polytheism, if you were to stand up and talk about the one God, you're going to be shot down. What did Paul do? Did he cater to what they want or did he stand up for the truth? I also found an altar in this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship to an unknown, I proclaim to you the God who made this world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. She's telling them, I don't care what you believe, there is only one God. And this one God made the world. And then when they heard about the resurrection day, some mocked. Others said, we will hear you again about this. And Paul went out from the midst and some men joined him and believed. So here we actually have a situation where people will mock you. If you stand up and say such ludicrous thing is to believe there's one God. But some men will join him. Some men will believe. All right? And there will always be some. When Paul was persecuted in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, don't be afraid. Go on speaking, don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you or harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. God is telling him, stay there, continue the mission. Why? Because they are my people. They are there. You just need to stay there and continue to preach. Right? Elijah, in the northern kingdom with King Ahaz, fighting with King Ahaz and Jezebel, in the depths of his depression, God actually encouraged him. He said, I will... Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. You're not alone. All the knees that have not bowed to Gabal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Paul, earlier in the chapter, says, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
You see, when Paul tells him to preach the word in and out, uh, in and out of season, to prove, rebuke, exhort, it is not for everybody. It is a fact that there are people who will listen. There are people who are God's people who are the elect and therefore he must remain sober and he must continue to preach. Billy Graham, before he died, had preached to 2.2 billion people heard his messages. 250 million live audience at one go. 185 nations where he preached. You know how many became to know Christ? 2.2 million decisions for Christ, which is a 0.1 decision rate. These are the elect. If at all, they continue and in the end. The majority of people will reject your message because they have got itching ears and they will not tolerate sound teaching. But we have to be sober, endure suffering, and continue our ministry. Why? It's because of how we view our life. We leave a spiritual legacy of the people whom we teach behind. We warn others of the spiritual challenges of time. We tell them the truth. And number three, we pour out our lives for things that matter. You see how Paul views his life? Three metaphors. An offering, a race, and a fight. For I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. What he's saying is that his labor was offered up like a drink, like wine to make God smile. You know, everywhere in Near Eastern religions, they all believe in a drink offering given to the gods. The most expensive glass of champagne or wine poured out on the altar as a representative of our, our sacrifice for him. The Greeks have it as well. The Israelites as well. They have the cup of wine poured out for God, representing victory, Sabbath rest, and dedication to God. Paul always regarded Ask us to regard our lives as a living sacrifice. My appeal to you, therefore, in Romans chapter 12, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. A life poured out for others is a life poured out for God. So I'm ready to be poured out. I'm ready to die. Actually, it's, it's just not the one instance. He's, Paul's life represented a whole life poured out to God. A life poured out to God is a life poured out to others where we serve them. And the greatest need is for the gospel. Here is Paul who wrote 13 out of the 27 books of the New Testament. Significant contribution to our understanding of salvation. Three missionary journeys establishing the church in, in much of the known world at that particular time. This is how he poured out his life to serve other people while there was time. The alternative for us is a wasted life where you take the expensive life which God gives you and you pour it on the ground. Here are three of the richest men in the world. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Richard Branson. You know what three are doing? They're racing to go up into space. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, God has placed eternity into the hearts of men. And it's something that drives men. They want to reach for the stars. They want to reach for the heavens. And all three are moving towards that. And here we actually have Blue Origin, which is a rocket which Jeff Bezos built. And recently, he actually had a lottery, or sorry, it was a uh, auction. And one chap won the right to go into Blue Origin with Jeff Bezos when he goes into space. And he paid $28 million for a 10-minute stint in space. And after the 10 minutes, he will come down to the ground and life will be just the same. You know, I don't know why they do that. If you go back into time, Socrates, the great philosopher, said these words, Oh, that someone will arise, man or God, to show us God. You see, our, our desire to go up into space, just even for 10 minutes, for $28 million is that, that desire to know something beyond ourselves, something that transcends ourselves, something in space, something of God. Oh, that someone will arise, man or God, to show us God. And Plato answered him, unless a God-man comes to us and reveals to us the supreme being, there is no help or there is no hope. And Plato is right. A man has come from God. 
His name is Jesus Christ. And when He comes, and He came 2,000 year ago, years ago, He ignited a flame that touched so many people's lives. And I remember the life of this one gentleman who's really inflamed my life for Jesus Christ. And his name is John Sung. A great book which I read in, my, in the 20s has still affected me to this day. He, he describes himself, John Sung, as the flame for God. Uh, Leslie Lyle wrote this book. John Sung, at the age of eight or nine, would experience the blessing of a revival in his town of home church of Hinghua. Two, three thousand were saved, and he actually joined his father preaching at the age of 13. He, they actually called him the little pastor. Years later on, he went to the United States. It was brilliant. He earned a PhD in chemistry, and in those days, in the 1930s, having a PhD in chemistry is not a small feat. And not only that, he had won gold medals and prizes for these secular pursuits. And then he had an experience, an encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ that was so inflamed him for Jesus that they actually locked him up in an asylum because they thought he had gone mad. This guy who is a scientist now suddenly believes in God and is, is, is carrying on day and night about the gospel. When he came back in a boat outside Shanghai Harbour, just before he landed, he took all his degrees and his gold medals and his awards and took him and threw him in the sea. And he became an evangelist, not a chemist. And within 12 years of active service, 1928 to 1939, this evangelist turned revivalist shook the church in China and Southeast Asia. You know, at the end of 1949, when the communists had taken over the China, there were one million Christians in China at that time. Two to three hundred thousand were actually converts of John Sung. This is a chap who would take Bible studies two hours, three times a day. In 1936, he preached through the whole Bible in one month to 2,000 participants all over the China and Southeast Asia. Here is a picture of him in Singapore preaching at the Teluk Air Methodist Church. 40 sermons in two weeks consistently over the years, unrelenting. And not only that, he, the people whom he trained up lit the fuse that would be the church in China today. Look at Lim Pui Hien. He became an evangelist, Fukin prophet, and thousands of people came to know Christ because of Lim Pui Hien, who is a disciple of John Sung. This is a life that is described as a flame. And years later on, they dug out some of his diaries and someone actually wrote about this recently and he wrote this John Sung's diary and John Sung wrote, for a servant of God to have authority in every sentence he utters, he must first suffer for the message he is to deliver. Without great tribulation, there is no great illumination. John Sung, flame for God. Paul, a wine offering poured out for God. For the time for my departure has come. The word departure I want to share with you is a very significant word. It's called analusis in, in Greek. It means the time of my loosing. It's like a ship being loosed from its moorings or soldiers breaking out of a camp. I think we're too tied to this world. And the thing that stops us from being put out as a drink offering is the time where we're, we're tied up to this world. And, and the, the great preacher Tim Kellam, Two, thyroid, two cancers, one is thyroid, and recently even worse, pancreatic cancer, for which he's been having chemotherapy. And the, he had four prayer points for many of us who love him and follow his sermons. And the second prayer point is for Kathy and me, that we will use this opportunity to be weaned from the joys of this world to be and desire God's presence above all, which is impactful. Like he's a guy who wants to be loosed, loosened from all the moorings of this world that bind us and to desire God's presence above all. How, how do we see our lives? Do we see our lives after the pandemic? Last few minutes, we were about 50, 70 years old. How do we spend our life? Oh, travel all the world because we haven't been able to travel the last two years? Or do we see our last remaining years and last remaining opportunity for us to pour out our lives as an offering to our Lord? You either pour it on the ground and have it wasted or you pour it out for our Lord Jesus Christ, who will reward us, good and faithful servant. And at the end of his life, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So the race, the, 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 the race is a metaphor that tells us about when you live your life, you live it with in, intention, attention, 
effort to a particular goal. You don't run a race by running in circles. You run in a particular direction because there is the finishing line. Are we living our lives in such a way as to please God who called us for His purposes, a holy calling to glorify His name? Or are we running around in circles? Paul describes his life as one that's intention, that's full of effort, self-denial, because he wants to glorify God. And it doesn't matter when you, whether you come to the race late or with full of baggage, you're stumbled because in Philippians chapter 3 describes this race. Not that I've already obtained it or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. The beautiful thing about this race, it doesn't matter when you come to know Christ. It doesn't matter whether you fall down, you get up because you forget what lies behind. But what we need to do, brothers and sisters, is strain forward to what lies ahead. Lying ahead is the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, which is why he, He's waiting to be loosened from the moorings of the things that bind us. Because as you run closer and closer towards the finish line, closer and closer towards the goal, which is actually to be with our Lord Jesus Christ. That desire must be there. And you know, with God, every beginning has an ending. And I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. He didn't say that you will run the race and you will complete the, 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 the race on your own. God who begins a good work in you, He is the one who will bring it completion on that day. The race will be completed by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. With God, every time He begins something, He's got an ending. And when He begins to work in us, He will bring it to completion. There are casualties which are inevitable because of the sinfulness of man. Demas, in love with this world, has deserted me. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me great harm. The Lord will repay him. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. All who were in Asia turned away from me among those who are phygalous and homogenous. At my first hearing, Nobody stood by me. You know, when you go there for the court hearing, your friends will stand by you, your lawyers will stand by you, they will say you've been a good guy. When he was in his first hearing, nobody stood with him. Everyone deserted him. May not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. So at his first hearing, the Lord res actually rescued him. And then... The second hearing, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. By the time he had the second hearing, Paul was sentenced to death. They walked him down that road outside Rome. And history tells us they chopped off his head. And where they actually martyred him, today there's a church called St. Paul outside the wall. Is this a life well lived? Brothers and sisters, we need to take stock during difficult times of what our lives are worth. During the time of COVID lockdown, it's not a time of repression, so that one day when the COVID is over, we can be out, we're doing all the stuff that will make us happy. We need to finish our lives well. We need to understand. We need to leave behind a spiritual legacy, which is the Church of Jesus Christ. We need to warn people of the truth of the spiritual challenges of the time. And we need to tell them the truth of the gospel. And we need to pour out our lives for things that really matter. We need to serve each other, even during lockdowns. Call a friend. Talk to someone. Provide meals. Practical aid because we only have one life and it's going to be poured out either a glass of champagne for yourself or poured out for our Lord Jesus Christ because He's the only life that matters. May God add a blessing to all of you. Now, some of you who would want to, want to transact with God this morning and want to come before Him and say, Lord, I, I want, I've not been living my life as well as I should be. I really want to give it to you. I really want to pour my life on things that really matter. I don't know how to do this. I, want, I need help. I need prayer. Send pray to FPCE via Zoom 
and one of us will come and meet you and pray with you. Don't be alone. You can't do it alone. He who began a good work in you will complete it. And the others, if you decide to follow Jesus, you'd like to attend Alpha, you'd like to attend a life group, or you've got prayer requests, please click on this QR code. Let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask, O oh Lord, that this day, that so many of us, the Holy Spirit speaks to us despite EMCO, despite the difficulties, that we actually reevaluate what our life is worth. Is our life just a matter of living and enjoying ourselves? And, and, and this COVID MCO is a suppressive ev uh, event that actually suppresses us from enjoying ourselves? Or, or is this an opportunity for us to reflect and see what is the meaning of our lives and, and how should we finish our lives well to glorify you, to make things that last? Guide us, we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.